Please be seated. And thank you for waving your palms. It is a celebration Sunday, of course, as we celebrate the beginning of Holy Week, as we celebrate the opportunity to gather with one another, as we celebrate the arrival of the Messiah in Jerusalem, as we celebrate each and every part of our lives. What a privilege it is to gather today. Certainly, as we gather on our hearts and minds this week are the events that happened in Nashville. We continue to try to understand as a society how it is that we go about responding to events like this. They become more and more common. The Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program actually has, believe it or not, an active shooter response team. That's how prevalent this has become in our society. I wish that I could say to you, this is exactly the next step we should take to fix this, to make sure that our children are safe in school, to make sure that we're safe in our places of worship. But all I can think to do is take one step, to put one foot in front of the other and hope that as I do so, that I will find the paths toward reconciliation and toward hopefulness for each and every one of us. So I invite you to take a step with me, if you would. This evening, we'll gather here in the sanctuary for a time of remembrance or a vigil, if you will, an opportunity to light candles and say the names of those we've lost. We certainly will remember our friend, for many of you in the community, Red, who lost his life soon, uh, just a couple of weeks ago as well. It's a time for us to grieve, but it's also a time for us to remember that we are a part of something bigger, that we are a part of resurrection, that we are a part of new life, that we are a part of hope. So let us gather with that sentiment and let us worship God this evening. I also invite you to be a part of other activities this Holy Week. After church today, we'll have our final Gospel of Mark uh, gathering to uh, share in Bible study for this particular Gospel. Monday, Thursday, our confirmands and our deacons will lead us in worship and, and a great meal. And so we hope that you'll be a part of that service on Monday, Thursday. It will be a service of Tenebrae, which is a service of shadows, if you're familiar with that. So we'll extinguish candles as we go through our worship service together. Uh, the worship will be short, so if you are a kid that has homework or something like that, know that you'll be home in time to finish all that up. You're welcome. At 6.15 a.m. on Sunday morning, we will have our sunrise service at Hillside Cemetery. This is in conjunction with Wilton Congregational Church, and we hope again that you will come and be a part of that. I will preach then and then preach again at 10, so, uh, you know, if you just can't get enough of sermons, come on. We'll have it uh, twice that day. Also, at 10 a.m., we'll have our worship service here to celebrate Easter Sunday with special musicians, with special music, and with an opportunity for us to gather as the people of God. I hope and pray that this place this morning in particular is one of sanctuary for you. It's one of celebration. It's one of contemplation. It's one of exactly what you need in this particular moment in your life. In the midst of that, we come together. In the midst of that, we come together to worship God. Good morning, everyone. Before I call the children up here, I just want to share this week, as you know, um, as Pastor Mark had indicated with the um, family in Wilton who had been a victim of such a horrible crime, um, we mobilized together and came up with an opportunity beside the GoFundMe page to be able to contribute a heartfelt gesture um, that we um, asked everyone and invited everyone to take part in. And throughout this week, we were able to collect an entire basket with gift cards um, to be delivered uh, by Margaret this week to the family up on Partrick Lane um, for Alicia and her son, Golden Gray. Um, so we are grateful and thank you for all the gift cards. And I also wanted to make note that um, the way our church family mobilizes and um, gets going uh, is unbelievable because church was taken outside these four walls when um, one of our congregants, Kristen Campbell, actually reached out to a friend of hers who works for Melissa and Doug uh, here, and she as well has um, offered to donate a bunch of toys from Melissa and Doug for Golden Gray. So thank you very much to Kristen and everybody who was part of this initiative. Now, if I can have all the children come on up here, please.
Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody today. So, how do we feel about parades? Do we like them? Are they fun? What are some things that happen at parades that we get excited about? Bubbles. Bubbles. Grayson? Floats. No. no. Oh, you just did a beautiful segue for me. Well, at parades, we're often cheering on the people in the parade, right? So I have with me today, thank you, Ollie, some noisemakers. Okay, so if each of you would take a noisemaker. Hi, Reed. Can you reach in there, grab one? Perfect. Take a noisemaker. There we go. You may have to pull hard, okay? Carol. Riley, pull Carol. super hard. Yeah, there we go. There are pizza trucks at parades? I'm coming to your parade. Here we go. Pull hard. Or there you go. <laughs> it works. All right, Riley. That, on cue, on cue. Hold on, hold on. All right. So, as Riley just showed us, can you all blow them and make sure they work? All right. They work. So, this morning, I want us to imagine that we're at a parade, all right? And we are honoring the very first astronaut to ever step foot on the moon, okay? So this parade is in his honor. And I'm going to describe the parade, and as the astronaut passes by, I want you to blow your noisemakers, okay, in celebration of our hero that we're honoring in this parade, okay? Can you do that? So... Let's get ready, because the parade is about to begin. Wait a minute. I think I hear it. OK, I think I hear it. Oh, here comes the police. They're starting off the parade, the fire department, the band, the floats. And oh, here comes our hero now. Here he comes. Here he comes. Get ready. Blow your noisemakers. There, there you go. Awesome. There he is. And then as the parade moves down the street, we hear the band fade away. Okay. Now, this was a little bit something like what happened over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem when a king entered their city. And everybody wanted to get a glimpse of this king. Okay, and they stood out, and this king rode in on a donkey, and they waved their palms like you did this morning in celebration. They didn't have noisemakers, but they screamed, Hosanna in the highest. He cometh in the name of the Lord. He's coming. And they were waving their palms really loud, just like we did with our noisemakers today. Well, who was that king? Who was that king? It was Jesus. You're right. And today is Palm Sunday. And we remember that day when Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem and people cheering and waving the branches. Now, it was that day. Okay, everybody listen. Good job. I know they're so fun. It was that day that marked the beginning of a week that would see Jesus cheered, but then also see Jesus arrested, put on trial, that's not something to cheer about, though. Rested, put on trial, treated very poorly, and then put on the cross and put to death, right? But as that sad week ended, there was another week that was about to begin just the way we did today, and that's with a celebration. So I hope you'll all be with me next Sunday for another start of a week celebration. Okay, so let's go to church school now and let's hear more about Holy Week and what happened between now until our next celebration, shall we? All right, let's go. Watching those noisemakers, 
reminded me of a children's sermon I gave one time where I handed out nose flutes, which is a very complicated instrument to play, but once you've learned how to do it, you can do it quite well. And of course, they're quite noisy. And um, a friend of mine was getting on a plane with her two kids right after that. And the kids insisted on playing their nose flutes on the plane, which I'm sure was really lovely for every other member of, that was on that plane. Um, but then because of this, and because they were blowing through their nose, they both got ear infections and had to have surgery. <laughs> that is the children's sermon gone very, very wrong. <laughs> I don't even remember what my point was with that particular children's sermon, but I do remember my point for this particular moment, and that is, yes, we make mistakes, right? Yes, there are things that we go into with the best of intentions and have them fall apart. Yes, we are human beings, and yes, as we go through each and every part of our journey, we are dependent on the grace and compassion of our siblings uh, that forgive us, and we are dependent upon this same grace and compassion that comes from God. So as we come to a time of prayer this morning, I encourage you to consider those things that would unburden you, those things that would lighten your load, those things that would open your heart to the spirit around you and within you. I encourage you to think of those moments in your life that bring joy, even in the midst of confession that make us chuckle. I encourage you to pray for the world. I encourage you to pray for your family and for yourself. Whatever prayer is upon your heart this, mo this morning, let's take a moment of silence together and lift those up. God, we confess that we aren't sure how to move forward following more tragedy in our community and our country, following differences of opinion on how it is that we rectify these situations, how it is that we keep one another safe. But God, we pray this morning that our confession would not lead us to an action. That simply we can show up, that we can walk the walk, that we can move toward better ways of being, ways that encourage one another and keep each other safe. That whatever our confessions this morning, confessions of sin, confession of shortcoming, confessions of confusion, confessions of simply not knowing what to do next, whatever our confessions, God, may lifting them in this moment unburden us enough that we would experience your joy, that we would experience your wisdom guiding us toward better ways of being, that we would experience your love and compassion, which is far beyond our capacity and our understanding, recognizing that as we experience the fullness of you, we would be reminded that we are created in your image, and that we are empowered and emboldened to do your work in the world. Then may our prayers move to the world, to the ways that we can be better as a, society, as a society, to the ways that we can care for our planet and for one another, for the ways that we can create sustainable ways of living. Because from our very moment of creation, this is what you've called us to do, to take care of one another and your world then may we simply find ourselves in joy. Joy that brings peace, joy that brings motivation to share compassion, joy that want, makes us want to tell your story over and over again because your story is one of joy. Well, God, we lift each and every prayer this morning, praying that as we do so, you would receive them and that you would return to us the motivation to go about our own lives in ways that are new and holy, in ways that are refreshed. For God, we pray all these things, recognizing that as we do so, we pray together and we pray the prayers that you have called upon and put upon our hearts. Hear them this day. Amen. My friends, I will always remind you that there is nothing that you could do that would make you an unlikely recipient of God's grace. There's no way that you could be that you're outside of this grace. And so today, accept the call and the responsibility, the privilege of simply living into this grace, recognizing that as you do so, you are forgiven, recognizing that as you do so, you are motivated to forgive and help others, recognizing that as you do so, you experience the deep joy of God. May you share that peace, that joy, that compassion, that forgiveness with one another this morning. I greet you with the peace of Christ and encourage you to do the same.
As we respond to all of the goodness in our lives, as we respond to the freedom that comes from confessing and letting go, as we respond to our call to worship God, we respond with the fullness of who we are, giving thanks for the ways that God has worked in our own lives and offering a bit of that back to one another. So as you share your gifts this morning, I encourage you to consider your spiritual gifts and the ways that those could strengthen this faith community. Also consider your financial gifts and the ways that they help build up the church and support the ministry that happens here. And consider the ministries that happen in other places today and the ways that we can hold them in prayer as they share their gifts as well. The morning offering will be received. Oh God, we give thanks for each and every way that you are made known to us. And this morning, we especially give thanks for the beautiful voice of Rebecca and the way that we hear your voice through her own. We offer all of our gifts, be it song, speech, our financial gifts, our hearts, our spirit, back to your work in this place. May you use them so that others may find relief and presence in the world. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. This is a reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. You can find it on page 19 of your pew Bible. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on, and spread those on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. 
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Again, let's turn to God in prayer. Well, God, we are grateful for the ways that you speak to us. And so our prayer this morning is that you would open our minds, our hearts, our spirit to your voice, which is always sounding, always calling to us to be your children and your disciples. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. So it was a parade that I was in. It was actually the Macy's Day Parade. I, I wasn't in it, but I was watching it. And this was my very first time watching it in person, not on television. And it was pretty impressive. This was way back in the 80s. And I think it was long before there were concerns about uh, any sort of pandemic. It was before Times Square had been cleaned up. So there was a little bit of edge to the whole thing. It had this whole vibe that I just loved, but my favorite part was there was a kid that was on his dad's shoulders, and he would say, oh my gosh, dad, oh my gosh, dad, here, here comes Clifford the big red dog, and the dad would be like, wait, who's Clifford the big, big red dog? He'd be like, dad, you know who Clifford the big red dog is, and it just went on, and oh, dad, here comes Blue's Clues. Well, wait, who's Blue's Clues? And, oh, he's on this channel at this time. You've watched it with me a hundred times, and this went on and on the entire parade, and it was awesome. They had this whole banter back and forth, and, and when we talk about the parade that's happening, we call it Palm Sunday, and the Bible is called the Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem, it makes me wonder, who actually knew who Jesus was at this point? I mean, we know from Scripture that he had so many people following him. That's how they, we ended up with the feeding of the 5,000, or the lesser-known story, the feeding of the 4,000. is as he was healing people, and, and people were following him because they were so excited about this. He had a trail of folks that were behind him. So yes, there were people that were following him, but he was coming into Jerusalem. And I bet there were kids who were saying, hey, wait, Dad, who is that? Or even moms who were saying, wait, what is this all about? And someone who knew Jesus would say, ah, oh, come on now. You've heard this story. You heard the story about blind Bartimaeus and how he was healed. Oh, and you had to have heard the story about when they cut the hole in the roof of that house so the paralyzed guy could be let down so Jesus could heal him. That's who's coming into town. That's why everybody's freaking out. That's why everybody's excited. You know that Jesus is the one that's coming into town. Maybe if you didn't know who this Jesus was, that that was just enough. Wait. I hadn't heard this story about somebody cutting into someone's roof. Were they just ticked off about that? I mean, a thatched roof is a lot to get through, right? And, and a lot of expense to repair. No, 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 but that's not the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that guy that came in on a stretcher walked out on his own two feet carrying that stretcher. So suddenly people are like, well, what do we do? Well, we're going to do what we do when the king comes to town. We're going to start cutting down branches. We're going to create a parade. We're going to make this a big deal. If this guy is who you say he is, then we need to treat him as we would treat any other dignitary that's coming into our town. But then it went a step beyond that. Because I think people were so moved by the stories and so moved by thousands of people now following Jesus, that they started to take off their cloaks, that which they had, which was valuable to them. They made themselves vulnerable around one another. They made themselves vulnerable around Jesus, and they put them on the ground. They put their clothing on the ground alongside these branches, trying to show that, yes, they were starting to get it. This was making sense. All of these stories that we've heard about, now this is the man that's coming into town. If that was the full story, it would be enough, right? 
the excitement around healing, the excitement around a new way of doing things, all of that had to be so motivating for people that were gathered that particular day. But I would lift up that I think it was all a lot more intentional than just some haphazard parade, just some word of mouth idea that we all need to gather at this moment. You see, if we read this particular passage through the lens of intention rather than perhaps the lens of magic, and if you've been in my Mark study, this will sound familiar to you, it begins to take different life. You see, right at the beginning, we hear that this all begins at the Mount of Olives. That's something we can easily read over, but Jesus was intentional about that because the prophet Zechariah said, yes, when the Messiah comes back and is, comes toward the temple and is getting close to Jerusalem, it will all start at the Mount of Olives. Jesus is so intentional about what he wants to have happen here. He knows Zechariah backwards and forwards. He knows every prophecy that is a part of that. And Matthew himself even says, Jesus did these things to fulfill the prophecies. Jesus is being very intentional about how things are going to happen. And so when we get to the next phrase, and it could seem really magical, if we look at it again through the lens of intention instead, to me, the story takes a dramatic turn. Because Jesus says to his disciples, listen, I need you to go into town, and I need you to find this person. And when you find that person, they're going to have a donkey, and that donkey has never been ridden. And you offer that, you say to them, I need this donkey. And if they say, but why? You say, the Lord needs it. Whenever I've heard that story for most of my life, I thought that Jesus had somehow surmised all this, that in his wisdom, in his godliness, he knew that this existed and he simply sent his disciples there. But if I change the lens, and if I look at this as a very intentional act of Jesus, I think how amazing it is if he went ahead of them. If he went ahead of his disciples and found this person with this donkey, up, it would make sense and it goes in line with the story because Jesus is so intentional about making sure that each and every person that is around him understands how he is fulfilling the prophecies that these folks had studied their entire lives. And so for him, again, he is pointing back to Zechariah, which said that he would ride into town on this donkey. Actually, there's some, uh, so there's some debate with that particular piece of it, because if you read this in Hebrew, it actually translates that he was going to ride two animals of differing heights into town. But that would have been quite a task, I guess. And so he just went with the donkey, which was close enough, I guess. So anyway, but in this particular story, how amazing is it? When we consider that idea, that it's less a miracle at this point, and simply the intention of someone who loved his disciples, the intention of someone who loved the people that were, fo that were following him, the intention of someone who, would, who loved the people that were soon to greet him. To me, the story becomes that much more magical when we take out the magic. Because it is the purpose of this story to remind us that Jesus was fulfilling this prophecy. That he was saying to each and every person that was a part of this story, yes, we are going to have challenges. Yes, there are going to be scary parts of this. But yes, there will be celebration. Yes, there will be new life. And yes, in the midst of each and every moment of it, we can be intentional intentional in how it is that we care for one another, intentional in the ways that we understand how the prophets spoke God's voice and how that voice of God is working through us right now. That is the intention of the story. I believe that when he comes into town, people sense that. This isn't something bigger than we can imagine. In some ways, yes, but is something that we can access. It's something that we can be a part of. It's something that we can celebrate because we see now that we are empowered to do the work of God. We are empowered to be the voice of God. We can take off our cloaks and raise our branches. We can make a difference. 
such a beautiful story at that point. And I believe that this is a faithful understanding of the story because the very next piece in Matthew after our reading today is when Jesus finally shows up at the temple. And at the temple, it isn't that he goes in and he worships. He goes up to this temple and in anger, he turns over the money changing tables. Right then, at that point in time, he shows each and every person that is a part of this story, we can make different choices. We can come into the temple with hearts that are open to the possibility of God. We can do things differently than we've done before. See, Jesus understood that often at these money-changing tables, people were shortchanging the people that came in to buy their particular animals for sacrifice. And so Jesus saw this corruption and said, listen, we can do this differently if we are intentional about it. It all could have fallen apart at that point. Who shows up at church and starts turning over tables? Who shows up at temple and starts claiming he's right over the leaders in that space? Who does this sort of thing? Someone who, from the very beginning, understood the power of prophecy, understood the, empower, the power of intention, and understood the power of gathering people around him that would be a part of the story. So Jesus in his intention, Jesus in his purpose says to each and every person that was following him, yes, you are part of this story. He says to each and every person who gathered on that parade route that day, yes, you are part of the story. He said to each and every one of us, Yes, approach this intentionally, and you are part of the story. There's no magic or miracle at this point. There is simply you and me doing the work of God in this place. That is what is empowering about it for me. We don't simply have to wait on the miracle. We don't have to wait on that which God will do. We wake up and recognize that we're already a part of it. We already are empowered to raise our voices, to throw down our cloaks, to wave our palm branches, to say, Hosanna, save us, to say that we are part of God's story, to say that we are recipients of God's grace and that we dwell in God's compassion. We are already empowered to do that. And so on this Palm Sunday, I encourage you to do it intentionally. Don't simply walk through this parade, but raise your own palms. Don't simply approach Easter Sunday waiting for a miracle without also recognizing that you yourself are a miracle. Don't miss these opportunities to be intentional about your own faith journey. Because I believe that when you do so, you align more evenly, more clearly with the work that God is already doing in your life. Holy Week blessings to you. Amen. Sorry, Brian, but I'm going to embarrass you. So there you go. That's what you get for sitting on the front row. But I want to tell you, if you want to understand Lent, if you want to understand resurrection and new life, if you want to understand the possibility of God at work in your own being, just look at Brian. Brian has had quite the haul with some health issues, and yet here he is. And when I saw him, even though he is so tall and I'd seen him before, I had to do a double take. Who is this guy standing in front of me? I didn't expect him to be here today, and yet there he was, and my heart just leapt. And I hope that yours did the same. Because as we have heard about Brian's challenges as he went through his surgeries and recovery, we were always hopeful for this moment. And the fact that it comes on a beautiful spring day on the cusp of Easter and Holy Week speaks volumes to our own faith and our own love and compassion for you. And we're grateful that you're here with us this morning. Thank you, and thank you for letting me embarrass you. Let's give Brian a round. We continue to pray for all in our midst who are struggling, who with health issues or any other issues that are going on in their lives. For those who are trying to understand how to be families in the midst of challenges that come there, 
We, of course, pray for our siblings in Nashville and the churches there. As many of you know, that was the Presbyterian Church of America, not a Presbyterian Church USA, which is our denomination. But nonetheless, we're all affected and we're all a part of the same traditions and the same values of life and hopefulness within that. We pray for those who continue to be victims of war. We pray for those who continue to perpetrate war. We pray for those who continue to put forward their own agendas rather than understanding that we all should have the same agenda. We pray for each other. Whatever our prayers are this morning, we pray them knowing that as we do so, God hears. So let us join in prayer together. God, we are grateful for a screaming kid in the narthex of the church that reminds us that this is how we are to show up, full of wonder and excitement, ready to just shout and lift our voices. And so take away our reticence and take away our fear so that even in the midst of our challenges, we would do just that. We would be reminded to worship and give thanks. We would be reminded to celebrate each other, even when it's a little embarrassing. We would be reminded that we are all in the midst and need of healing. So as we live into our healing, and as we recognize and name new ways that we want and need to be healed, we pray that you would be with us, that you would lift us up, that you would restore us so that we may find that which we need so that we may offer that same thing to another. God, we understand the ways of compassion and grace, the need to care for one another and the need to find our way to healing. Because we have shared the stories of Jesus Christ. and Together, we share his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, go in peace, and as you do so, approach each and every step with intention. Recognizing that as you do so, you have choices to make which will bring you closer or farther from the divine. As you move closer and make those choices, as you are intentional about your steps, I pray that you would find new life and resurrection this day and always. Go in peace. Amen.